I have Michael Arcee on the podcast today, lovingly known to me as Tiny Sir, or Arce, or uh, The Bald One, or, uh, you know, I had a lot of names for him when I worked with him back in our radio days uh, at Clear Channel and iHeart, but he is a healthcare communications professional, spent his time in radio honing those skills to make a difference in the healthcare field. He's also a Freemason. And we talk about it. Uh, you're actually going to be surprised how tame and interesting it really is. It's not some super dark occult thing. It's just a whole bunch of dudes doing cool stuff. But um, we share some inside jokes and we can't help with a laugh about it. If you fathom what B equals D is, you win a prize. Like if you can figure it out and the, you win. And that prize is B equals D. Uh, you can get in contact with him on Instagram and LinkedIn, Michael RC is very uncommon. And so you're either going to get him or his uh, son. So uh, if you have any questions or you want some insight about, uh, you know, Masonic life, hearing their stories, their opinions, or how relatable things are across all different cultures uh, to, free, uh, to Freemasonry, you can actually listen to a podcast that he hosts called the Craftsman Online podcast at craftsmenonline.com. Uh, and now, my episode with Michael Arce. On today's episode of the Professional Amateur Podcast, I have a, an old friend, <laughs> uh, a mentor of mine when I got into the space of uh, broadcast media, Michael Arce. Or should I say, hey, Arce, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> hey, sir, I'm here. It's weird, though, because you're like seven feet taller than me. <laughs> But you're sitting, so I feel like because of the camera, I, I finally get to be... T so this is what your life looks like. You yes, look that's, yeah. that's what it always looks like. You look at the tops of everyone's head. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you for the invite. Um, I have been a fan of your amateur professional. <laughs> <laughs> the title alone cracked me up, and i um, glad that we got the time to get together. Yeah, I mean, it, it. it's funny, like, the whole idea of the professional amateur, I always kind of, like, touch on it. It, It is that weird um, drive that an amateur has, that they have the, the, like, a thirst to be the best thing that they could possibly be or whatever they're doing. But, you know, I, uh, you could be a professional and still be an amateur, and it's beautiful. Because when you mm -hmm. combine it, you're always trying to get better, even though you are doing the thing. Um and then uh, somewhere I took a left turn, and then I just wanted to learn about everyone else's things. <laughs> Very but, natural. Yeah, uh, that's that's what always happens. So let's um, let's get into what you do. You know, I <laughs> I, I I say when you know I met you, it was broadcast media. Uh, what it, where did you come from? <laughs> Besides, you know, oh, there's the obvious joke there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is a family rated show. Nah, um, don't worry about it. So I. Uh, <laughs> Well, I was born in San Diego, but I grew up in Yuma, Arizona. So I, I would say if you're going to drop a pin as to like where my career, my amateur professional, professional amateur career began, uh, it would be in Yuma, Arizona when I took my first job at one of the three local radio stations in town and um, did that. I went, I got, uh, the day after I graduated from high school, I moved to Tucson to uh, go to the University of Arizona. Uh, to pursue a communications degree, which never got completed. Uh, <laughs> I was offered uh, my first radio contract at 18, and I thought, hey, this is great. And I stuck with it for probably about 20 years. Um, and in that time, I bumped into <laughs> you, uh, which was towards the end of my career, in radio <laughs> at least, because uh, I started to see the, the light, the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel for that industry. Mm. And, you know, our generation is that weird, we are analog that converted to digital. So we remember both mediums, but really kind of have a foot now more into the digital space. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I could see where it was going and realized, hey, I need to get off air and online. And I think that's been one of the greatest um, gifts that I've had is in, I've encouraged others is to kind of like yourself is like you have your core skills and talents that you would fill out or whatever. Um, but being able to be flexible and see like, hey, this could also apply here or mm -hmm. uh, this title, I might not fit all of it might, might not accurately describe me, but there's certain parts of it that I know I could do and I'll learn those other things, you know? Yeah. Um, and just always being able to have a mind and, and an eye out there for the next thing I think is, is key, uh, in a professional career. So yeah, when I finally left the radio world, um, I had gone back to school at the age of 35 to <laughs> finish <laughs> the bachelor's degree that I think I spent a whole six weeks into, um, that was an eye-opening experience, uh, finished school, and was like, woo, got this bachelor's degree, can't wait for all these jobs that are going to come my way, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's the funny part when you're, uh, a, a, I wouldn't say, a, a, but you're a more experienced adult, I would say, uh, at that age, but having the same mindset of a recent college grad, like, oh, you just get jobs this way, mm -hmm. and finding out, no, it's not necessarily the case, but... Um, it did kind of help point me into the direction of where I wanted to be career wise, which I've always had marketing skills, um, kind of a trained storyteller. And it wasn't until a little bit later in my career that I fell into the healthcare space. And, um, well, the sight of blood, uh, does not agree <laughs> with me, <laughs> um, helping people by giving them the information they need to make important personal decisions so that they can, maybe have a healthier life or a better outcomes or reduce some of the chronic disease problems that we face. Uh, that became my passion and, uh, went back to school, got an MBA in healthcare leadership. And then recently, like totally, totally finished school. I swear, um, did some post-grad studies in health law and policy because so much of our American healthcare system is, you know, legal based. <laughs> yeah. So it's good to have, have that background. Um, but yeah, now I'm in Washington, DC and, uh, um, you know, working to advance, you know, healthcare priorities. See, I, I, like I, uh, was saying before we started, there's, there's, there's always a left turn someplace and that mm. that's a big one. Um, <laughs> because it, it, it happens to a lot of us, even with me and the whole graphic design and web development, I hate that stuff. My and that I heart was what showed me I hated it. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, it was funny because I'll bump into friends I haven't seen in a while, and they're like, "Wow, you're not on radio anymore! I can't believe." It. I'm like, "Yeah, just like for you, it's like, but you're so gifted and talented at that." <laughs> yeah, but that's not what I like to do. And yeah. until you've been in that space where you're like, "That is not a passion of mine." Yeah, it's a talent. Mm -hmm. I could do it all day, every day, but it's not what fulfills me it's this other thing. And I think the, the thing that makes our passions so unique to us is because it's not something that perhaps we might be naturally gifted at, that we have to work. It's the challenge, the struggle, and we can apply these, this other skill-based set that we have and the confidence that we have in ourselves, because that's the thing that we feel most rewarding at the end of the day doing. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it, it's like, I took a lot of little pieces of what I learned from iHeart too, like, uh, uh, the whole digital marketing side. And, and when you left, you know, I had to fill your shoes without being, you know, compensated for it. And then as it, as the entire idea of markets went away and became regions, I had to fill more shoes of what would be a bunch of Michael RC's in different markets. And there was no compensation for it. That's when I started going, I don't know how much longer I, I'll be in this, this, <laughs> this arena. <laughs> well, what it did for me was, I mean, one, when the company that we worked for before it became that company, when they had their massive reduction in force and literally mm -hmm. like laid off and eliminated 15% of their workforce, that was an eye opening day. The second mm -hmm. one was the harsh reality that I came across where I'm like, have you ever heard of a radio person that retires? No, they literally have to work until the end of 
until they can't anymore. And there's yeah. just not that thing that they can go out at. Not the ones that you're thinking of, like Howard Stern is going to be okay. Yeah. But that local morning DJ that you probably can't even remember their name anymore that used to be your companion that played the songs you like and gave you traffic and weather reports, there's no golden parachute for them. No, that's that's it. And, you know, uh, what I saw, you know, when I started finding my love, and I, I actually credit iHeart for this, my love of photography didn't come until iHeart. And it was mm. only because I was forced to go take photos. <laughs> take the pictures of the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the <laughs> other thing, too, is that when – you know, again, friends, family will say, oh, you're not on radio anymore. It's like, yeah, well, when you see the thing that you love slowly die or slowly start to die, yeah, you're able to say goodbye to it on your own terms, right? It's much yeah. different when um, you get walked to the door and it breaks up with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Funny story that I'll tell you about that after this. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that, um, yeah, it it turns out and you know there was another a sagey you know youtuber that i watched that you know he he has a theory about the rose color the goggles that we put on in life and that we tend to only remember the good things because our brain is constantly trying to push out the oh i used to hate this job i'm like yeah i, I remember at certain points in my radio career where i would literally pull up into the radio station parking lot and i was you know still doing morning radio at that time and i would be sitting there at 3:30 saying a, a, a quiet, silent prayer to God that I would get a better job offer or that my next contract would take me out of this market or just, and I, I didn't realize it at the time, but those are part of the warning signs that are like, this really isn't working anymore. You're forcing this relationship to continue. You, you need to move on. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, it was definitely eye-opening going from a market like where we were in Albany, where it was, you know, it was a bigger market. It wasn't a huge market. And then going to Sussex, New Jersey, which was like market 220 of 221, basically. And to see the drastic change in everything and um, how behind they were, I was mm. like, I was like, I... I'm going to come in here and I'm going to do a lot of good for this place and they're going to learn about social media and they're going to probably have their best year ever without me, um, cheating the system, like <laughs> right <laughs> with magical codes. Um, but I, uh, I ended up blowing their numbers out of the water because they were doing nothing. And I, I just did what we did in Albany and mm -hmm. it worked. It worked. And then that's when I started realizing, I was like, Oh, I can do this because I know how to do this. I just don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. And from that point forward, that's when I was like, there needs to be something else. And it la it lasted two more years there um, until uh, we actually decided to make the move to Georgia for my wife's work. And we had the opportunity. And at first I remember Kelsey, who was, my go-to my basically my manager in Hartford he he even said he's just like before you you do all this do you want to transfer down to Atlanta and I'm like no <laughs> uh I don't even need 24 hours to think about that no, no I, yeah and I, I said here's what we'll do and I laid out we laid out a huge plan to transition because I was handling all of trafficking for the nine or ten markets that were part of our region. So uh, if somebody screwed up or somebody took me away from my job, like Hartford was the one that always got hurt because they spent the most money and had the most digital buy-in. Mm. Uh, so what would happen is uh, things would go haywire. Um, so I said, I'm going to transition so we can have, you know, two people kind of pick up the slack that I'm going to be dropping. And um, he said, oh, that's great. We have all this time. You know, he came to Sussex. He's like, man, this place is dismal. This is, you're tucked in the mountains. There's nothing up here but black bears and, and like, meth, ad meth addicts. It's kind of <laughs> crazy. Um, and so 
he was like, all right, well, we've laid out this game plan. I was like, all right, well, let me go tell, uh, tell him, you know, put in my resignation. Uh, we have six weeks minimum. I'm giving him like six, six weeks that we can transition. I can teach because doing ad traffic was not fun. And there was a lot of hoops to jump through and a lot of know-how that the ne they needed to know. And, um, they decided to fire me <laughs> and not they, as in Hartford, um, the, uh, manager of that market and Poughkeepsie corporate overlords. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I laughed and I said, well, Kelsey, it was a fun plan, but it's, it's done. Uh, they want me to leave now, but I'll, I'll at least finish out the day with you who you are my direct manager. Like I directly report to you. Mm. Um, so, and he's like, wait, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that they said that, uh, I'm trying to screw over the, uh, the market, not the region, just this tiny little market that doesn't even exist to anyone in the company. Mm. Um, so, uh, all of the like quarter million dollars in ad buys that, that Hartford needs trafficked. Sorry, I can't help with. <laughs> and he, he just sat there and he was just like, oh my God. Mm. I was like, yeah, I was like, but you know what? It shows me that uh, I wasn't worth anything and that's okay. I can go on to my next thing without, without any guilt on my conscience that, you know, oh, I tried and failed. But like, no, I, I tried and you just didn't care. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's, um, it's a lesson I, I learned that doing the thing that you know how to do just because it's easy is not the same thing as doing the thing that you love, even if it's hard, um, to go, to become a full-time photographer and use all those talents I did have with marketing and, and to have a, a niche like pet photography is so it's like, Oh, that's weird. It is when you look at it from the surface, but when I fell in love with it, <laughs> And it got me national recognition. I got published in magazines and all of a sudden I was like, wait, this, this is, this feels great. I'm, I'm getting acknowledgement for the thing I love doing It's like, and I'm making people happy with pictures of dogs, which <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a beautiful combination. <laughs> I think the jokes there are just, uh, writing yeah. themselves. So I'll just leave <laughs> But yeah. yeah, when you when you made that tra uh, transition, and just like every other uh, friend who has taken on that entrepreneurial spirit, and I've been ex for one extremely supportive, of course. And then the other part of it is, is you get a little jealous because um, for everyone that I've seen become successful, like you, and I think that you know the term success doesn't mean. Uh, they back up the money truck truck every week and just yeah. uh, push it into the swimming pool for you to swim around <laughs> like Scrooge McDuck. Um, but you see that this person is able to really do what they want to do and that yeah. they get completeness from that act alone. And guess what? You don't. Yeah. You, uh, not, not you, but me, <laughs> Others, <laughs> the rest of us, uh, we still have to wake up every day and go serve our corporate overlords. Um, and hopefully find, you know, goodness in, in our own unique way. And so for me, it's, I've always been insanely jealous of people who have been able to take that, um, take that step and go, Hey, I'm going to bet on myself a little bit here and see what happens next. And yeah. I've just never been able to fully embrace that because I don't have a great idea like pet photography or <laughs> any of yeah. that. I, it, it is, it, it, but it's, it's always strange is I didn't find out what I wanted to be. And when I grew up until I was 36, I was 35, 36 when, when we got our pug and mm. that's when like I started taking photos of her and we made an Instagram account. And then all of a sudden that Instagram account grew exponentially really fast. And then companies started offering us money to do work. And I was mm. like, Oh, Oh, okay. It's this like is... having a child actor yeah. <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Except there's no labor laws against, uh, right. public, so. 
<laughs> don't have just to other things you got to worry about. But yeah, I mean, um, once in a while yeah, poop on the floor. But <laughs> right. Well, that was the thing. I'm like, I'm now following a, a dog. Who, and I remember in the early days of this, I'm like, yeah, my friend has an Instagram for his dog, Philomena, uh, and I follow this dog, and but she comments on things. But is it Stefan or is that Nina that's the one that – who's the voice behind the dog? <laughs> and, I, and what's really great is back then it was mostly Nina. I did all the content, and I would like do the social – like posting the social media, but she would always like write up the thing. Nowadays it, it's like – 99 percent me mm. like, and well that's how i know i know yeah yeah <laughs> definitely 100 percent uh and i i love it um but <laughs> but it it it's uh it's been that weird journey where it doesn't seem real and from that branches off a million other projects that i started doing like i you know between it's all under that wheelhouse that umbrella of photography and yeah. And dude, you have merch for your dog. Like when I yeah. saw the pins that were coming out, like seriously, like mm -hmm. to see all of that, I was like, wow, he has taken something that wasn't even of the millions of conversations that you and I ever had <laughs> about a variety of different topics. This never came up. The idea of one day working for yourself and not wanting to be, you know, tied to a big corporation anymore. Yeah. That, yes. But never this. And yeah, yeah I, I mean, like I said, just have been on as an outsider, like super supportive and yet at the same time, insanely jealous. Well, I do thank you for the support. You know, <laughs> the, and, uh, you know, making people jealous, is kind of, it's kind of cool, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, because, well, and I look at it as because if the jealousy is there and what it ends up being is it's motivation for a lot of people. I mean, some people just become sour and like angry, but a lot of people see it and go, well, if he can do it, what the hell? I can do it. Like, right. He, I can figure it out. Like I can figure the thing that I like doing. And sometimes it doesn't even turn into a business, but like if you can find the thing that you love doing then that's the important part. Most of the time what ends up happening anyway is that you might not think it's going to become a business and then it does. It just yeah. happens naturally over here because you're so invested in it. You're so passionate about it. You, you end up doing it for a living and that's, that's what's crazy. And like you, you even said, your passion f for that, for the healthcare space, became so great like that's what you're doing now like right, it's not right. just like oh yeah I, I i'm i care about this it's like no i actually have a passion i i purposely went back to school made sure i understood more about this and you know and you got to a point where now where you are where you're like i'm trying to make a change because yeah well and i think the other thing is like i i do have a a side project that i hate when people are like do you have hobbies i'm like god that is such a 1950s question that yeah geez i can't believe um <laughs> but there are some things that you know if you had you you just can't get away from it is no matter how hard you try so um about seven years ago actually when we were still working together was when i first started getting into uh freemasonry i became a freemason awesome. um it uh lodge in schenectady when i was living there and, um, you know, time passes. And during the pandemic, when New York State as a whole was literally shut down, couldn't go <laughs> outside of the state anywhere, um, another Masonic brother and I uh, had a conversation of like, well, hey, can we start a website so that brothers can connect and we can share blog posts or mm. uh, at the time, because we couldn't have our meetings, it was, you know, Zoom meetings were insanely popular, shocker, like everywhere yeah. else in the world. Um, so we started a, our website and kind of started a company, which I'm like, oh, this feels kind of serious. Um, <laughs> yeah, when you register an actual like, <laughs> yeah. LLC, you're like, wait, I'm paying money to do this now. And, but I'm not making money off? Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's where the, uh, the idea for Craftsman Online uh, started. And about... 
uh, six months. Well, in you know, as the marketing business person, I put together you know our strategy of like, okay, this is how we're going to build our audience, and this is where we're going to go here, and here's the different you know checkpoints and blah blah blah. And they're like, oh, what about a podcast? I'm like, oh no 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 no, no. Well, that's going to be way at the end because. You guys think it just magically happens, but it doesn't. A <laughs> uh, little bit behind the curtain here. Um, if you do, depending on your show, so for us, uh, it's you know a year, so it's every Monday we drop a new episode, so it's a 52-week season for us. Um, I don't take holidays off. Uh, I book a guest, usually weeks, if not months in advance, Got to research the topic or whatever we're going to talk about, send them the outline, coordinate the recording, do the recording, and then there's the editing that comes afterwards. Mm -hmm. And then remembering to upload it is another key thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you do so many of these that you just sit back and you're like, oh, yeah, I did talk about that or I had that person on. And you're looking at, like, what's working and what's connecting. Um, and we finally get to a point where – with our podcast, we were creating a revenue stream. It's insanely small. Uh, you could probably get a Happy Meal or two at McDonald's. <laughs> but at least that little $12 we get in ad revenue every month pays, ironically, for the streaming service that we use for our podcast. But um, it has been kind of a joyous thing. And it's weird because I come downstairs and my wife is like, what are you working on? And I'm like, ah, oh, the punch. She's like, yeah, that's like another job for you. And I'm like, it is, but I don't get paid for it, but I do. The reward yeah. is the work. Yeah. Uh, I always tell people that about the podcast too. And like, this is, it, it becomes a, it's a labor of love. That's that side hustle type thing where I, I and I always hate side hustle because it's, you're like, oh, so you're doing it to, to try to make that extra money. I'm like, no, 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 I'm doing it because I, I like doing it. This is the only reason why I'm doing it. Right. If I didn't, if I didn't like doing this, I would not do it. I, I've learned in life that doing things I don't want to do. Um, I mean, uh, granted, there's things that you, you have to do. Like, oh, I have to go for my annual checkup or th you know, things like that. that. That's fine. But if... I'm going to be spending creative energy on something I don't want to do when I can take that and put it into like writing a, a book, which you know, that's something I've been working on or maybe working on a new blog post or uh, booking clients or creating anything, doing anything <laughs> besides that one thing. Like to, there's no point in it. it. It's, it's better to follow what excites me. And I have fun doing. And, you know, if I make money in the future from it, then great. And if I don't, then I don't. But the thing that I'm seeing, especially with podcasts, is um, it became like behind my curtain was like I get to catch up with all these people I, I, I've met over the years and uh, acquaintances of those people and talk to them and learn about them. So it's like my way of catching up with friends and but on the front end of it what people see is all these people that decide to make these changes or, or do these interesting things in life and you know you even said it like yes yeah, seven years ago it, you started like how did this is where i was getting with this nice little hmm. long segue to this is <laughs> sure sure how how did you all of a sudden go Oh, Freemasonry. Hmm. Interesting. Let's go there. Like, oh, where? Yeah. where, where, right. where? <laughs> um, well, there's a, there were a couple of factors that kind of built up into it. So uh, the first one was, um, you know, in my first marriage. Uh, so my, my best friend in college, who was the best man at my wedding, um, after, you know, he moved to Rhode Island. And uh, his name's Pat. And Pat, uh, his new father-in-law was a Freemason. And that's kind of how it started where he's like, Hey, I just started going to these meetings and I think you would like this. You like American history. Um, you know, at the time, like all the national treasure movies with Nicolas Cage had come out and the <laughs> Dan Brown stuff was mm -hmm. starting to come out. Um, not that any of that 
yeah. has anything to do with it. <laughs> I was going to say, like, yeah, so it's all Illuminati and fun Yeah, yeah. And it, it's like, like the <laughs> chocolate dipping of the ice cream. If you want you want to have this uh, chocolate dipping on the top? Yeah, but once you bite through it, you're like, that's not, it has nothing to do. It just yeah. makes it taste better, I guess. Um, but it gets you in the door, right? Mm-hmm. Um and I, I would just summarize by saying, like, my, my first wife was not extremely supportive of me wanting to pursue an interest in joining a Masonic Lodge. So, fine. Mm-hmm. Shelved it. Literally, I had a book, and I just shelved it for a while. And it was after I had gone through my divorce, and literally every day I would drive by the Rotter, or in Rotterdam, in Schenectady, there's the Five Corners Road, there's the... Mm-hmm. Uh, Schenectady Masonic Temple there, and I would mm-hmm. literally drive by that every day. And there's the sign, and it's kind of hard to miss it. And I'm like, this is like a calling card. I'm staring. I'm like, what does it take to do this? I'm very interested in what this is all about. There's the mystique, the, the mystery of it. Um, so that's what happened. I just applied, and um, which is you know relative term, but yeah, <laughs> it, it was just something that was interesting. And I'm like, yeah, I, I'd be kind of curious to see what this is all about, and. Um, Obviously a good fit. Yeah, well, it, you've been at it now for, what, seven years, you said, roughly? Uh, and- yeah, just a little bit over seven years, yeah. And, I mean, the the thing is the next question, you know, usually in, in Freemasonry uh, that people ask is like, oh, well, you know, what's it like? Is it the secret society? And, um, you know, there's a lot of wonderful, fantastic um, stuff that's out there uh, in – Having known and met a lot of, you know, brothers, I'm like, yes, we are secretly controlling the world yes. one pancake 100%. breakfast at a time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, I, 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 I kind of always laugh at it too, because like a lot of people uh, with a lot of, a lot of societies in, in general, they look at it from like this occult aspect of it. And I'm like, no, just look at it at what it is, because right. that's what is like what do you what, don't you don't have to make this like super secret thing of, of about it in your head if you just talk to any freemason they will talk to you and it's oh like, yeah yeah <laughs> whenever <there's... laughs> i go out and i've you know got my masonic ring on and i could be at a bar or wherever and somebody will catch up with me they'll see it they'll start asking questions um yeah so it but it's it's interesting because I would say, yeah, there's some special things about it for members that, you know, once you're into it, like the the making yourself a better person and, you know, some of the tools for all that are all wonderful parts of it. Um, The community service is fantastic with what some of the amazing things that Freemasons do in the community where we're not looking for any kind of recognition. It's just we see a need and we fill it. We step in and to fill the need. Um, there's a ton of history. There's, you know, just a lot of areas that you can explore into. But ultimately, um, it is like any other organization or group that one would get into that others would be like, oh. And as soon as they start talking about it as to, like, what really happens, you're like, yeah, and that's not for me. I checked out, like, five minutes ago. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's, it, That's exactly it, though. Uh, you know, I, I always had a friend that was, like, really deep into it in college, like – deep into the lore not the actual history of it mm. just like the lore that he would read online or, or in like on like some maniac's blog and i would be like you, you know the easiest way to really get information about it is just go, go to the lodge right down the yeah road. ask them yeah. just ask them he's like but no but it's I'm like yeah but it, they have like like every Thursday night at seven, they have like a like a social hour there. Like they come on in out front. Yeah. Like <laughs> he's like, no, I couldn't do that. I'm like, what? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then you know that's the the most recent conversation I had was uh, at an airport bar slash restaurant, um, waiting for a flight, and uh, the gentleman that was you know sitting next to me, you know, eventually you know saw the ring that I was wearing and. He's like, oh, so are you a Freemason? Yes. Oh, yeah, my grandfather was a Freemason. Hear that? I hear that a lot. You know, some, well, it's great. Well, I always thought that they were going to ask me or invite me to come and join. It's like, don't do that. We don't solicit (laughs) for members. Like, 
So what, what, what do I got to do to become a Freemason? Well, congratulations. You took the first step. You asked one about it. And just like you said, like, find a lodge that's near you and go. Yep. <laughs> like, it's... they will be happy to have you come as a guest. Like, you'll yeah. get a great dinner, some socialization, and then you'll figure out if this is something you want to do. Exactly. And I know I, I a long time ago, I, I got, and it wasn't for me because I'm... I'm a weird bird, obviously. So, but it just, it was like, Hey, that's that. It's not for me. I appreciate what you guys do. And then I found my love of pugs and that, that was it. That's, <laughs> that's, that's my society. Yeah. See, that's your thing. And yeah. five minutes ago, I was just, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, 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 I love it. And I, I love hearing about it too, just because it, yeah. It kind of like quiets that that weird voice that a lot of people have in their head about any sort of society. Uh, but you know the the whole thing with the Freemasons is like people always equate it to like something crazy, and it's just like, oh, dude. So uh, I don't know if our our listener is going to be able to. Do they get to see the video of this as well? Yes. Or okay, yeah. so behind me is my bookshelf. Mm -hmm. um, this row is all the books I had to read for college on healthcare, leadership, change management. That row <laughs> is literally all about Freemasonry and hmm. different parts of it. And um, the one thing I would say is that it never baffles me. There are three degrees in Freemasonry that over time, just like anything, have been altered, changed, edited, recast, revision, blah, 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 whatever you want to say. Where does it all trace back to? Couldn't give you with any certainty. <laughs> oh, it's a, this date. Because there's different documentation. And then this group is so old that it's before paper was <laughs> yeah. widely available. Um, but the thing that I have taken the most from it is I would have never picked up a book on Buddhism to study some of the teachings of Buddhism. I would have never purchased a copy of the Quran to read some of the way that the Quran also has the same connection to biblical stories. Um, I am not a huge Bible reader. I don't go to church on Sundays. You don't have to be this re super religious person. You just believe in something bigger than yourself is the best mm -hmm. way I could describe it. Um, I'm a big history nerd. So anything that has to do with ancient Egyptians and some of the ritual and, you know, uh, rites of passage that they would have performed, I've got materials on that. You find the thing that you're kind of into, and this is the rabbit hole or healthy distraction. Um, I have a poetry book from, um, a Middle Eastern poet that I haven't even cracked yet because I literally have all these other th books that are just stacking up and stacking up. It's in the queue, you know? Yeah. The other cool thing is, is that like any group or organization, um, what I find really compelling about Freemasonry is, is that I'm not alone in this search for knowledge that there's other brothers that I can talk to. Now, not everyone is into the same things that I'm into, but the ones that are, uh, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not alone in this world. I also like to take pictures of my pet. I have yeah. pins of my dog as well that I <laughs> have online. Yeah. So there's, there's that community that's in there as well. Um, and you, it's, it's very helpful because I find myself, whether it's reading, you know, stoicism, ancient Chinese or uh, Eastern philosophy, um, and, uh, having a knowledge and an awareness of those things so that when you go into a conversation with somebody or they start talking about something in the back of your mind, you're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a little educated on that. I'm a little versed in these things. Yeah. Um, that to me has been tremendously helpful. Plus I learned how to tie a bow tie. So that, you know, was another big win. That, I think that alone, that's why you should <laughs> Join the Freemasons because I don't know how to do that, and I've watched many YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, for a shameless plug, um, you know, if you are a man, a man who's an interested in Freemasonry, or you know of one, um, we got a great podcast. It's the Craftsman Online podcast. I am the 
gracious host of that. And we have a ton of topics that we talk about. Everything that we put out on our podcast is what we would say for open to the public. So we actually do have, you know, quite a few discussions and so on some episodes, sometimes debate on certain things. Um, you'll learn some of our terms and words that we use and, uh, it's all out there for information and entertainment purposes, just like this podcast. That's, you know, that's, that's awesome though. Uh, Cause that's, that gives it, uh, I hate to say like, oh, it makes it human because it, it is human. It's, it's a thing, <laughs> but it's right, like, yeah. it, but that's important. Uh, it's so important to, to, for something like that. Just because uh, it has a stigma, just as most things do that. If there was like this, even if there was like a whisper of, oh, it's something weird. Uh, <laughs> great. <laughs> well, like my, my favorite discussion, um, I was in San Diego recently for work and went to a uh, bar and stepped outside to have a cigarette and ended up having a 20 minute conversation with a man because he, again, spotted my Masonic ring and was asking me questions about Freemasonry and was kind of interested in joining. And I'm like, Oh great. Well, you know, there's a couple things that are required for you to be considered for membership and, it appears that you pass one of them. You're a man. That's, you know, it is a male fraternity. We do have female organizations or groups that are associated with it. And I said, well, this, and he's like, well, do you have to believe in God? And I'm like, well, that's the big hold up. Yeah. Um, certain jurisdictions or states, because there's no real international or national governing body in Freemasonry. So we use the term jurisdiction. I'm like, you know, in New York where we lived, uh, they say you have to believe in a, a supreme being. Others yeah. will say a higher power. Some may say God, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to believe in God. The, God yeah, whatever. the guy with a beard on, on a throne in the clouds. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the George Carlin God. Yeah. Um, and he's like, well, I'm a Satanist. And I'm like, oh, well, then you probably wouldn't have a good time in Freemasonry. Well, yeah. why? Because Satanists. And I'm like, well, yeah, we actually, that's one group of people that we can't let in, but you also probably wouldn't feel comfortable coming into a meeting where there's an altar and what we would call the volume of sacred law, which is any religious book or text that a member wants to have open. You would feel uncomfortable about that. You would feel uncomfortable about the prayers that we have, which are just like prayers that happen anywhere else. You would be uncomfortable with biblical references, not in the religious aspect of it, but in the, this happened at this time and this place. And that's why we're pointing to this thing. It's someone that doesn't show a love or an interest in those things. It wouldn't be a good fit for you, you know? Yeah. So yeah. yeah, that's, and that's, um, I think that was like the big thing with me. And back then I was, back then I was uh, atheist. Now nowadays I'm more agnostic. Like I okay. do believe believe that there is something greater than me out there. I, that's that's a thing, but I don't have a label for it. And that's that's fine. I just go knowing. So yeah, but but yeah, I would that, say I mean I fit. That's the mold for me too. That was the big hold up question because the the three questions are you know do you believe in a supreme being, higher power, whatever word you want to use, right? Um, and I do, but I can't point to say, well, this one or that one. Yeah. Uh, in my first marriage, we would go to Catholic church where they pray to the one true faith. And I just could never really embrace that line as I was. <laughs> 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 um, I don't believe that. Um, and it's in having I grew up in Arizona where there's Native American tribes and hearing their explanation or their stories or their traditions, you know, and their cultures. And I just felt like pointing to one minimizes everyone else. Yeah. So that's it. The, the second question is, is the, do you believe in the immortality of a soul? And it seems like a large question because it's really significant and important and that do you, not necessarily do you believe that you live forever? Because we know that that doesn't exist yeah. as people. Um, but do you believe that, you know, the life that you live touches other people's lives and that your legacy does not end when you stop breathing, that it goes beyond the grave, so to speak. Um, and most people would be like, yeah, I do believe that. Like think of family members that you have that you still hold great revenance for. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, are you a man of legal age? That's the other 
question. And in most areas, you have to be 18. Some still it's 21. Um, you check those boxes off and you, congratulations, you can petition to join a Masonic Lodge. And the days that I was going through my degrees in my, my class of, there were seven of us that were all going through these together. Um, one of the brothers is Wiccan. And, uh, you know, he had all these tattoos that were to the different Wiccan, um, I, I, I don't want to use, what's the that? Deities. Deities, the, yeah, gods. Kind of and he, and I, I asked him, because when you go through the degrees, um, at a point there's the obligation, which if you've ever, you know, seen the constitutional uh, oath administered to the president of the United States or have testified in a court case, Similar, but also different. Yes. Um, you have to put your hand on a volume of sacred law and take an obligation. And you can choose whichever one you want. And he went with the Lodge Bible, which I thought was interesting. So I was like, hmm. well, as someone that is Wiccan, and he's like, oh, well, I just associate, you know, the, the god of wind or the god of fire or this or the other, the natural resources to the parts of that are being talked about in here. I was like, Oh, okay, cool. You make it work. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is, it's actually one of the most inclusive organizations that I've ever been a part of personally and professionally. M more so than radio. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a, uh, that's awesome. Like, so what's your, um, uh, not, well, I want to say your rank like it's the military, but that's not right. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, well, I'm just I'm I'm just a brother. Uh, yeah. um, but no, uh, and that's that's actually you know when you complete. Well, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you. So I'm I'm the senior warden of my lodge, but okay. that's not going to mean anything. But I'll I'll help you. I'll walk through some of the steps here. So um, if you have an interest in Freemasonry and you reach out to a lodge or you talk. To a brother at a bar who or outside smoking um and he's you know balding Loves about six feet Diego tall chargers. <laughs> slightly attract i mean so anyway so you talk to that guy right um we would call you an interested gentleman some places call you a prospect candidate whatever um you come to the lodge meeting a few times and you just say hey this is what's right for me now you have to fill out a petition in your own handwriting um, but we don't say, hey, Stefan, you're going to fill this thing out. Uh, we wait until you're like, hey, how do I go about joining? Oh, I thought you'd never ask. You've only been coming for the last three months. Like, <laughs> you've made more comments about the green beans than you have about joining. Um, so then you fill out the petition. And then your petition actually gets read in a lodge meeting, which you can't attend yet because you're not a brother. So uh, you, the petition gets read. Uh, then we actually have a, a committee that gets assigned to investigate you by the lodge. It's three brothers. Um, we typically like to come to your house. And as I tell brothers jokingly, you know, not to check your socks and undies drawer or see what's going on <laughs> in your fridge. Um, but we want to come and meet with you and especially the people that are important in your life. So uh, wife, partner, loved one, family member, friend, whoever's there, uh, just to answer any questions they have because I have – had some very interesting questions asked and I've also been able to answer them. Um, I mean, my, my favorite one was a one who asked if, um, camels were a part of something or, you know, you, you hear everything. It's amazing. Um, I'm like, no, no. Uh, we live in Albany, New York. I don't even know if there is a camel here. <laughs> Maybe at the Catskill game farm. I don't know. So, uh, and that was at that time. So, uh, your petition gets read, the brothers either choose to accept your petition or deny it nine times out of, well, 10 times out of 10, I've only ever seen a petition accepted by the time you get to that stage. Um, and then you're going to get a nice letter or email from a lodge secretary that you petitioned to saying, Hey, um, congratulations. Your petition to join our lodge has been accepted. Please show up, uh, on this night at this time wearing a dark suit and tie you'll be taking your first degree and that evening as soon as you take your obligation to become an, what we would say an entered apprentice which is the first degree of masonry 
Congratulations, you are now a Mason. You're not a Master Mason, you're a Mason. Only a few slight differences. You can attend meetings. Um, you can't vote yet because you're not a full-fledged member of the Lodge, but you're a Mason. Uh, that opens the door to your second degree, which we call the Fellow Craft degree, which kind of builds on what's talked about in the first degree. After the second degree, you take the third degree, which is the Master Mason's degree, which is a much larger and completes kind of the story that we present of Freemasonry. Mm. And then once you become a Master Mason, um, you can take an office in your lodge. You can go join some of the other uh, bodies that exist in Freemasonry. Some people have heard of the Scottish Rite. There's the York Rite. There's the Commandery. There's Shriners. That's another very popular yeah. group outside of what we do uh, in, in what we would call Blue Lodge, but basic Masonry. So for my job as the senior warden of my lodge here in D.C. is I'm basically the vice president of my club. <laughs> um, <laughs> and next year, it's assumed that I will run to be elected to become what's called the Worshipful Master of the Lodge, which is the president of my club. Mm -hmm. um, you serve that for a year, and then you become a past master, and you get uh, retired and... And then you get to be one of the grumpy know everythings <laughs> of your lodge, <laughs> supposedly. That that's awesome. Like, because, but yeah, it, when you break it down into simple terms, too, it's like yes, it's like this, like the vice president. Because uh, uh, I'm sorry, but the titles are actually <laughs> awesome. So when you oh yeah, well, there's the, I mean, <laughs> and that's the part of like when you go through the degree process, you get indoctrinated. People are like, oh, why do they call him worshipful? Like, oh, I knew you guys worship something, and I'm like. Okay, TV time out, TV time. Uh, <laughs> most of what we know in Freemasonry is based off of England, of a certain time period. And that's a term of respect to call somebody a worshipful. You'll still hear it occasionally. Um, what's really interesting was with the passing of the Queen, um, you heard of these titles and how they were introducing each other. And you're like, ah, I see <laughs> where they took some of these ideas in you know, either Freemasonry inspired those terms or Freemasonry borrowed those terms. Yeah. Um, so it's not like we, we worship the guy. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, well, now I know I Mike wants to do that. So. Yeah. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah, worship me. But, uh, <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's really awesome. Um, so I, I have to ask, so you, you, when did you move to DC? Like when, I moved on the best time to move, actually. Uh, we moved here on Memorial Day of 2021. <laughs> oh. So uh, I was joking, of course, because I would never recommend moving on a Memorial Day weekend. That's the worst time to get your mm -hmm. uh, things sent to you. And uh, I wouldn't recommend also moving during a public health emergency mm -hmm. or coming out of a pandemic because, you know, things move a little slower. I so. mean, no. Unless you were here in, in Georgia, where it didn't matter. Right. Because um, <laughs> yeah. you, you said 2021. If you said, like, uh, well, no, because April 2021 is when they were just like, oh, we're opening, um, we're reopening uh, uh, essential businesses, which was um, hair salons, massage parlors, and bowling alleys. <laughs> All essential. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was a uh, an emergency decree by... Uh, Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this would be the other area of conversation. Uh, I always feel like if the masonry doesn't make you want to go, hey, five minutes ago I checked out. Uh, when we get into <laughs> talking about public poli public health policy, which is what I do, uh, this is the other thing when I'm like, well, there's certain flexibilities in telehealth that were allowed to happen during the public health emergency, or PAG as we like to call it. <laughs> but now that that's coming to an end, there's governance issues that need to take place so that grandma can still log on to her computer to talk to her doctor. Um, but, so yeah. you know, what's funny about that is, is some people check out, but I, I don't because I, well, for my time in when I was on the insurance side of things, it was always interesting to see <laughs> the the nightmares that <laughs> that the healthcare system that. What we was had. your favorite CPT code stuff? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, it, it was B equals D, which was. <laughs> <laughs> but those were that was a small D. Yes, what yes, I understand. Yes, yes, very small, <laughs> micro actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
Uh, but, you know, I could see it then. That was, what, 12 years ago, basically now, uh, that I was like, man, everything is kind of weird. And if it's not going to take much to screw up all of this. And what's true for a lot of things in our country. Yeah. Yeah. I, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, and that was like the big thing um, when the, the whole pandemic started, which was we were just coming off of uh, a trip from Las Vegas, mm. which uh, was for the 2020 uh, Vegas pug party, which was 120 pugs taking over a hotel in Vegas. Uh, which oh, I was the man. event photographer for. <laughs> Would have loved a bit on that bus. Yeah, it's a very. It smelled like Fritos because if you've ever smelled a pug, that's kind of what they smell like. <laughs> um, but you know, we got back, and that, that was like the whole talk of when we were there was like, oh, you know, it's, this is getting kind of weird because it was like the end of February, beginning of March, and I was like, well, yeah, it is kind of weird, but you know, whatever, you know. It, if it really starts popping off here, we'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was kind of strange to be in the South. And yes. I'm because I'm not in downtown Atlanta, I'm twenty miles north, which is still considered greater metro Atlanta area. Um, but it is at that line where you're like okay, it's this really up and coming, really cool hip place and the old South. <laughs> so you get that good mix of everything here. Um, so the strange thing was, was seeing how everyone reacted to everything. And oh, yeah. when I tell people, especially all my friends back in New York and in New Jersey and just as a, entire northeast they're like yeah you know we're we can't do anything i'm like yeah um and i would just take pictures of like downtown alpharetta and everyone's out having a great time at the bars just chilling having a great yeah. and i was like you know we take it serious here because they said it's fine we can just mm. go for it and i was like why is no one on the same page with this right yeah i mean it it, it was what you're talking about, it was a, a challenging time because the, the pandemic hit and I just finished up my first year in grad school. Mm. And on I was going to school for healthcare leadership, which is basically health administration. It's how to run a hospital or you know health organization, right? So you're getting a mix of classes. I'm not a clinician. I can't treat patients. I wouldn't know the first thing. But I know somebody that could get you there. Um, but you are getting a lot of education on Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act um, mm -hmm. and the role of public health and policy and all of this. And the meanwhile, the real time scenario is happening that everyone's like, ooh, who knew that the government had this amount of power and certain agencies to do certain things. And I think, you know, so as a student, there was that. The second part was just as an American, it was the f it was the first time for me to see um, a large section of the population who openly distrusted or disputed what was being reported as factual, scientific research evidence. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of those things, and not just that, but then amazing. Uh, creative, interesting claims of other outcomes or solutions. And it was just the first time that I had ever really witnessed that. And I yeah. think that, you know, our parents saw similar things that happened when there was a distrust with federal authority or the government during the Vietnam War. We didn't experience that. This was ours, you know. Yeah. Um, so there was, there was just a lot of that. And I think what you're describing is – it was also something that, you know, moving here where originally we lived in Maryland and in Maryland where we lived in Montgomery County very much followed the directions of the, the masking requirements. Then we moved to Virginia where it was like mask. <laughs> what? Why are you wearing one of those? You know, um, 
and now just having DC in between us and like traveling and still, you know, that is still an area. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And, um, you know, if there was anything good that I think came out of the pandemic, there were a couple of them. One has been uh, an increased focus on mental health and mm-hmm. the real issues that, that 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 is. And the stigma yeah. of it has kind of been removed a little bit. Um, I think the second one is, is that we've all learned how to take more of a better inventory of our own personal health, especially when it comes to family history, because we were told, hey, this virus, which, by the way, is still out there, um, (laughs) it affects different people in different ways because of your genetic makeup. So what is your genetic makeup? Have you had a conversation with your parents about your genes? Mm -hmm. Uh, So there was that. And then I think the, the third thing is... Unfortunately, it also kind of showed us uh, in our social groups, in our family groups, and even in our workspaces, like, am I working with people who are like-minded? Because that can be a conflict (laughs) on a greater scale when there's someone that I work with or know who openly disputes what the rest of us are accepting as facts. Yeah. Yeah. and there's a difference when it's like, hey, uh, we're watching a football game and instant replay didn't show this. And, hey, there's different angles. And, okay. But then there's what has come out. And you're just yeah. like, all right. And I know for me personally, that's just where I had to kind of take a step back and um, sever some ties with folks on Facebook. Or was also very surprised in a professional setting to see certain people take what I would consider extreme viewpoints that were not mm. – uh, in line with mine and go, wow, I just, you know, a lot of respect has been lost for that person. Um, so yeah, there were, there were some, some good things, but also some bad things that came out of the pandemic and, um, definitely a, a learning moment, I think for the country and, you know, also for ourselves, like w- we learned what our limits are. Yeah. I, that was, that was a big, um, big discovery. Uh, as a whole like to be especially to be in the south and to to see what i saw and there was there was times where you're like okay i think i think we're understanding or everyone's on the same page and then it would just like it would spiral out so fast and what and what i've learned especially over time you know now we here we're coming out and coming towards uh almost three years so it's like the things that we learned along the way and, and like all the data that we gathered from everything and we're like, okay, this is great. Now we have a more definitive way to combat it, to protect against it, to do all these great things. And like, like, okay, well, masking doesn't do great for COVID. However, I haven't had a cold <laughs> in three right. years because it does well, great it, for that. <laughs> I mean, it, it, the one thing to kind of bring it back full circle is like yeah. the dream that we had as members of the online content team <laughs> now is a reality for everybody. Like, exactly. It was totally fine to be working from home when the thing that we fought for forever. Or the, well, hey, somebody needs to be in the office from your department, uh, even oh when there's God. three feet of snow outside. And yeah, somebody's got to be in the building, but we are online, our our job title, online. Nope. Or <sighs> Stefan gets better internet at home than in our building. Nope. Someone's got to be here for that. Oh, uh, that that always that was the one that always <laughs> drove me crazy. Uh, I'll never forget sending uh, screenshots of the speed test from within Sussex to everyone back in Albany going like, hey, I literally can't work here because <laughs> I there's no bandwidth. Like mm-hmm. uh, my phone, which barely had signal because it was in the middle of the mountains in the middle of nowhere, still had better bandwidth than the Internet that you guys are paying for. And I'll never forget. um Oh boy, what was her name? Coop and uh, Kristen. Oh. Kristen was like, "Wait a second, this is this is the internet you have there." I'm like, "Yeah," and uh, I I sent like a comparison in an email chain with her and Coop, and it was like, "Here's my internet at home, gigab- uh, gigabit, in- you know, fiber internet, and here's this," and it was like slower than dial up in 1993, <laughs> mm. and they're like. So how long does it, I was like, if I want to upload a photo for a post 
on social media, it can take minutes to upload a photo. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, 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 that can't happen. That can't happen at all. I'm like, I don't know how this, this entire operation is working with that internet here. Like, I don't know what they're doing in here, but... We got to plug it into the fax line port. That's the problem. We gotta... <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh, it's interesting. And I never thought, I've said this to so many like recruiters and colleagues, and I, I never thought at this age in my career or life, at this stage of the game, that I would be able to negotiate how and where I want to work. And... Um, for me, you know, the initial work from home model, uh, was like, oh, wow. So everybody that I've ever known that got to work from home, like, well, let me get my bathrobe out, my fluffy, uh, pajamas, <laughs> my comfortable little shoes, and I'll be working from the couch. And then I realized it is really not all that it's cracked up to be. Cause there's certain things I did like about going into the office that don't get to happen. Nerf gun um, fights. Nerf gun fights. Yeah, those, <laughs> very those things don't happen. Um, you know, plug in the tree. That doesn't get to happen. Um, just going out to lunch, little things like that, going out to lunch with colleagues. What started happening was, oh, my gosh, everybody has access to my calendar, and now I have all these, like, 30-minute blocks of meetings getting dropped in. Like, yep. I literally have to reject someone's meeting because I don't have time to eat, and I don't want to be eating lunch in a meeting that like, what are we talking about here? This is for what, why are we getting to like, so it's just, you know, it's different. And I feel like, but that's now going to be how it is. This is the new, new. Um, and it's a challenge we get to navigate. So, you know, the, the thing that also kind of came to me too, and I don't know if this is, you know, me almost being 45 now is now I'm thinking, okay, what is the next 20 years for me going to look like? All right. What's well, the next 10 years? All right. And then five years from now. So now you're starting to kind of like line up this retirement for yourself. Like I'm getting around the bend here, the finish line. I know where it is. I can't see it yet, but I know it's there. And what do I need to do to get across that? And that's kind of the stage of the game that I'm at right now, because I want to know, Hey, is there a way to, be able to step away and have that time for me still be working, but start to get to that. Re- Cause you're, you, you look at what your social security has for you. And most of us will be working <laughs> until we're 75. Cause that's yeah. So now you have to sit here and go, okay, well, where are some of the best places to live when you want to retire in the U S and everything is expensive everywhere. Surprise. Um, and there's just those larger things. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like not only am I beginning to look like my dad, I'm starting to sound like him. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but that's kind of, I think, you know, the other, you know, corner of life that you start to look for is that when you are a young person and, you know, high school age, you're just looking to get out of your parents' house and go do something with your life. You have these great big visions And then, you know, your 20s happens and then your 30s happens and then you get to your 40s and you're like, okay, my body now, I'm, I'm feeling old. Mm -hmm. I look in the mirror and I'm beginning not to recognize this face anymore that's been mine. Um, And now I got to start thinking about like, oh my gosh, and I really can't wait. And I hope we can connect in 20 before that happens, but in 20 years and be like, Stefan, we, we literally go to the store and that's why we all dress the same because we only have old man little sweaters like (laughs) will guys our age at 60 be wearing sagging jeans with uh, vans (laughs) you know will that be i'm so curious to see what it's going to look like i i think about it all the time too because i think of all the things that uh, you know all the things i was told when i was younger that oh you'll grow out of it like you'll you'll stop playing video games and you'll stop doing this and so i was like no no actually it's just now i i find i make time for it instead of just 
wasting time for. It's like, right. no, I, I, I need this because this is my thing. Like, I get to do this, and this is how I relax. And and people are like, well, what are you, you going to do? I was like, well, maybe when I'm 80 in some retirement home, I'm going to be playing, like, Smash Brothers against other yes. old people, and we're going to be throwing pills at each other. I don't know because I feel like that's where it's going to go. Right, <laughs> yeah. Dude, I, I'm so there with you. We have uh, – I, I'm old enough to where I have a sophomore in college now. Oh, my God. Yeah. My daughter is, is a sophomore at Siena. And I'm like, we got an extra bedroom. We, we have two extra bedrooms in our house. What are we going to do with these rooms? I'm going to make a gamer room for myself. Now I have a recliner in there, and I bought a PS4, and I got my flat screen <laughs> TV hooked up in there. And I go play video games at 45 almost years old. And Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, that's what um, I do. That's and that's what you know. What we started realizing because we got this big house here in Georgia that you know it, we looked at it and we're like, oh, we'll have all these extra rooms and for when family comes. And then my parents ended up selling their condo in South Florida and moved by my brother in Central Florida in Newport Ritchie, and mm. they bought a house. Yeah. So now that's where the, the holidays are. So I'm like, well, we have. All these no extra more, rooms. No more Orange County? <laughs> wow. <laughs> lucky you. So everything, like here, it's like my wife got into art really heavily, and now she's, like, become this, like, really great artist of selling all these pieces and does shows. And and she's like, oh, I wish I had more room to paint. So I just looked. I was like, well, we have two guest rooms. And how many guests have we had in the last couple of years? She's like, maybe one. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. So that one's going to become your painting room. So nice. simple as that. Because the, the basement's mine. I, I have the entire basement. Oh, that's where you're, with the purple light that comes. Oh, no. Yeah, it's a, all over everything. It's this, and it's purple right now, but it can be rainbow if I need it to be. Well, that's and, how I know. <laughs> <laughs> and it can go to, to sound, too. So I can right. throw dance parties on here. Yeah, and those <laughs> folks come from Starbucks. With the they saw the flyer. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. They saw the flyer. That's Took the bus. The stops in front of that. Yeah, okay. yeah. Good, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, you mentioned like where where you're trying to see where you're going to be in five, ten, twenty. It, where what <laughs> is in that game plan? What is in that game plan right now that you're like okay? So, does your seat come with a seat belt? because <laughs> um, i have the most radical idea uh and it may not be five years it's it the window for me could literally be one to three years it just really depends um but uh we want to move to mexico oh well yeah wow. that that's awesome yep well why Mexico? <laughs> well, I, I, the, How much time do we have on this podcast? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, honestly, uh, for some of the things that I kind of teased about, um, it's, you know, it's obviously a personal choice decision. Mm -hmm. um, but I've done a lot of – I'm a researcher, so I've done a lot of research into this. And, you know, I would say the factors are um, financial is, is a big thing. Um, the cost of living in America, uh, the way that I look at it is like, if you look at the U S it's a country, but if you start looking at it as a company, um, that has a CEO, which would be our president. Um, and then that would make us citizens, but also, uh, shareholders, <laughs> um, and all of us are paying into this company. So at the end of the day, does it really matter who the CEO is because this company is too big to fail in a global economy and it's always going to be taken care of. And honestly, what I deduced is I am very happy to give up my place in line in the rat race here and step out and go find a place if the opportunity was to present itself um, to be able to do those two things, to have a true work life balance. Mm. And there's a lot of pluses that obviously, you know, I have uh, concluded about 
relocating. And, um, you know, as someone who has uh, used to be a badge of honor, but not so much anymore, uh, who's a member of the U-Haul Million Mile Movers Club, <laughs> one more move um, doesn't really scare me. And yeah. um, looking at kind of what I had said, that long lens of saying, okay, I got 20 years until this point happens. Well, how can I start dipping into some of that? So mm. taking advantage of what opportunities are present right now, um, you know, Malcolm Gladwell talks a lot about the concept of that in his book, the outliers, the, the yeah. hidden moments that happen in, in success and what is success. But if we just use that as the framework for this conversation, I would just say, if the opportunity is you can work from anywhere doing anything and you could choose where you want to live that has similarities, but also some differences to the U S and you could always come back and visit. And you could be a, an American citizen that can legally reside in that country, mm -hmm. then why wouldn't you do it? It would be to me the same as if you said, well, hey, I've researched the top five best cities in the U.S. to live. And, well, that is going to move and change. But, you know, for the most part, uh, and I could just go pick up and live there. Well, if you live on the East Coast, you're going to be picking up and moving <laughs> pretty yeah. far either out west or, or down south. And mm -hmm. um, when you get to a certain point in your life, I think when, you know, your your kids have kind of grown up and no longer, quote unquote, need you on like a, and it's, it's going to be different for each individual. But for me, it was just like, well, we're going to just be downsizing. It's just going to be me and my wife. And really, we only see family during the holidays and this, mm -hmm. this, well, then why can't we do this thing now? So let's look into it. I mean, it's, I, I have nothing to say, but like, that's awesome. That's not a thing that you can, you can like uh, rebut because if you have the means to, and the desire to, yeah, you can go anywhere. You can go anywhere you really want. Yeah. And, uh, that's, like a big thing right now because of what we were just talking about it's like oh the work from home life is a real thing it's like oh you know uh nina still works for her corporate uh job and overlords yeah. yes <laughs> they they instated a funny like uh you could come into the office once a month type thing or not <laughs> it's just like what why but right <laughs> um but what's going to happen is, yeah, I have an uncle that lives in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, just outside of Albuquerque, and he's going to be having spinal surgery. And we were talking about it and talked with my parents and trying to figure out, like, you know, he's almost 80 or he's going to be 80 or mm. just turn it. But, uh, you know, he has all of his faculties, but an 80 year old having spinal surgery, never a good thing, especially everything that I went through with my wife and all of her spinal surgeries from the car accident. And I was like, well, what's stopping us just like living at his house for a month or two until he's better. Right. And nothing. There's literally nothing. So we started you know, figuring it out, writing stuff down. I'm like, yeah, this, this, we could definitely do this. And we'll probably in January move out there for a couple months and just, you know, make sure, give my neighbor a key and be like, Hey, just make sure no one's like trying to break into our house. Am I going to double dip and Airbnb that up? <laughs> I, I mean, it's something that uh, you never know. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> it, the thing. It, I mean, you, you take a personal inventory, right? And you know what you know. All of that could change the second you open that door and step outside. Mm -hmm. So you just go with, with that information. And, um, you know, I, not to get super deep on things, but a, a lot of wiser people have written, spoken, preached about what I'm about to talk about. But for me, uh, I call it listening to the universe, right? Mm -hmm. And that uh, the day that I realized when if as a planner, as a natural planner who always has a two, three, five year look on things, that when I was 
wanting things to happen. I was trying to force things to happen. And the job became a lot harder, the task to complete that. And sometimes it wouldn't ever get accomplished at all mm -hmm. whatsoever. And so one day I took a step back and I looked at it as in the sense of opportunity is everywhere. And there's unlimited choices that are presented to you every single day. Is your plan really what the plan is? Mm -hmm. Not to get religious or any yeah. you know philosophical deep or anything, but is it really what's meant to be, right? And when you realize that if you have like opportunities on one hand and your life in the other hand, when you stop trying to force or make things happen and you let things just naturally fall into place, it's almost like the gears. They just things yeah. naturally occur. Now, that doesn't mean that you can live like a leaf in the stream and just kind of <laughs> this isn't like Jim Carrey's, you know, yes, man movie. You still have to be present. You know, you still have to make choices. You you are still an active participant in your life. But. When you take a step back and you go, hey, we're going to get this opportunity to go to Albuquerque for two, three months. Well, what if it opens up to this? Well, what if it does? And that's that's the big thing is we um, – We could been be throwing pizzas at the poor individual that lives at Walter White's house. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I feel so bad for, for that entire – for a lot of those places in Albuquerque because of that show. <laughs> Um, but you know, we, we talked about it. this last year has been like a big transformation type of year for both of us. And we have learned a lot about ourselves and what we want to do in life. And the, the Southwest always calls to me because of when we went out to visit my uncle, uh, seven, eight years ago now. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was something about it something about that area and then we went out to the grand canyon and all this fun stuff and it's kind of like where like the dream of like really going for going for it to be a photographer uh, came from and then something about the land and being there at night just i get called to it and it wasn't until this last year where we kind of like I started throwing out ideas of like, okay, these are the places that I'm looking at that have all the things that we want. Right. That are actually in this area. And if we sold our house here, it would be not just feasible, but we could have a, like a small sigh of relief when we got there yeah. because, because of the difference in, in how much everything costs. Right. So, Going out there, I know that we're probably going to be looking at houses uh, like out in Santa Fe and, and things like that because we're going to be there. Why not do these things? And I'm going to be bringing my cameras and you know the tripod and everything because I'm going to be in the high desert. So I'm going to drive literally five minutes out um, – from where my uncle lives in Rio Rancho. It just, if I drive five minutes Northwest, there is no light pollution. There's you're in mm. the desert. There's Beautiful. just, and yeah. I'll be able to do what I love. And that's take pictures of the entire universe. And I was like, this, it's, this is going to be like a huge turning point. And I, I just, I know it, I'm not even going to force it, but I know we're going to get there and it's just going to be that feeling. Yeah. Because we don't have that feeling here in Georgia. I and mean, this is the longest we've been in one place. Right. Up, uh, well, like you don't have any it, – it's the – kind of the point that I made earlier is that why is Michael insanely jealous of Stefan? Because Stefan is willing to bet on himself and he's willing to sacrifice, which is a key word, to get to where he wants to be. So people always say that – and I heard this a lot working in country radio. Oh, Faith Hill, she's lucky that – I'm like, no, 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 no. You have no idea the pile of shit that – sorry. Faith Hill had to climb through in life to get to where she wanted to be. The sacrifices that she made and continues to make to be who she is, right? Regardless of how you feel about her personally. Um, and that's the thing is that you're at the point where, yeah, when I talk to friends about – 
the idea of moving to Mexico, there's three reactions that tend to come up. People that are like, oh, man, that's awesome. Jeez, I wish I could do that. But they yeah. can't because they got small <laughs> kids or a job that keeps them locked into a certain place. And they're like, wow, that is so cool. The second one is, wow, man, that's crazy. Why would you ever leave here? America's the best country. This, this, that. I'm like, but dude, I'm not renouncing my citizenship. I'll still yeah. be an American. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I won't be living in. Okay. That's cool. You know, they just, they, it's not something that they would ever think of leaving because they are content where they are. That's fine. The third group of people are people that are insanely jealous because they wish that they had the confidence to do it or had the position in life where they could pick up and make that change. Hey, it's kind of scary when you think about it. As I've told, you know, my wife millions of times. We're moving down there, two suitcases for each of us. All this yeah. stuff that we have. It doesn't come with us because you can buy more stuff there. Yeah. <laughs> like stuff can be anywhere. Like, yes, prize possessions. But, you know, seriously, like we are going to drastically downsize and kind of start. I'm looking forward to the closet full of suits and neckties and dress clothes, giving that away to people, uh, never needing a winter coat ever again. <laughs> Selling our car, like all of those things that are going to enable us to get to where we need to be, to releasing those things that I thought I had to have because they made me be able to be me. But yeah. they're not. They're just material yeah. possessions. And exactly. when you start to think about it, and I'm sure as soon as your feet hit the ground and you're standing in the place doing the thing that you want to do, it, it's the realization that comes to it and it's like, I could be doing this now. Like, why am I waiting? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's of sentiment that a lot of people need to hear because there are a lot of people that, that are in that category of, I, that they don't think they can do it, but really when you look at it, all it takes is a little sacrifice. And sometimes it's not even a big sacrifice. Mm-mm. Because I I still have friends I went to high school with. You know, we're all in our forties, but but some of them are still stuck in the mentality of, of like, well, I don't want to give up all my stuff. It's like you, you live in a studio apartment with like nothing. Will you give up what? Right. You you can put all your stuff in a fifty five gallon hefty bag, throw it over your shoulder, and be anywhere you want to be. Yeah. And they they don't see it. They don't feel it. So. I can't force that on them, but it's just, you know, you just have to be willing to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is that. And the other thing I'll say is like, you know, opportunity is everywhere. But the other line that I always say is happiness can be found anywhere. If you're willing to look for it, you will make new friends. You will have a new favorite, this or that. Um, you can still see everyone who's important to you because we live in this modern world. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. <laughs> do you need to be where you are? And you know, if that is the answer is, yeah, I got to be where I am to get what I, to, to feel how I feel in life, then cool. That's your thing, man, do it. But if it's yeah. like, no, I could be somewhere else. Then let me be that voice that says, then go do it. Like if there's anything that we all should have learned during the pandemic is that we had a lot of time with ourselves, literally ourselves to get into our own head and think about it. As there were times when we wondered, is it ever going to be normal again? What is normal going to be? If you didn't do your homework during that time to figure out now, here's your chance to reset, to get back out there, do it and really listen to that little voice in your head and start following it. Yeah. Uh, that's, Perfect, perfect way to uh, to wrap this up because you should listen to it and definitely follow it because you never know you might end up in Mexico or like my friend New Mexico. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I uh, I see it. I see it happen once in a while, and when it does happen, it's beautiful. And so I'll be an old Mexican, and you would be a new Mexican. Yes. <laughs> But I'd be a real Mexican. Yeah. <laughs> I would just be a faux Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> Which was my dad's like only response when I told him the idea of moving to Mexico. He's like, do you realize how hard our family worked? <laughs> you want to go back? 
Sí. <laughs> oh, that's that's perfect. I love it. So, while we wrap it up here, where can people find you online to learn about your stuff? Uh, see, like, oh, geez. podcast and all, you in general, if they want to reach out and touch you. Sure, sure, or, sure. Um, well, I, you know, it's funny. I the one or two, I guess, social accounts that I still have. Um, so I got locked out of Facebook when I switched to Mint Mobile and got a new cell phone number. And But honestly, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I wish I would have done it three years ago. Um, so Facebook is a dead-end route for me. Uh, ironically, Instagram, which is on my, So anyway, Instagram, um, I'm the only Michael Arce. Well, the only other Michael Arce is my son, but he doesn't use his that name. So that's where you can find me on Instagram. Um, and LinkedIn would be the other place professionally to connect with. Uh, you can message me through either one of those platforms. If you really, 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 you know, want to talk more about Freemasonry life, whatever. Um, and as far as the website, uh, if you're interested in more about Freemasonry or following or getting into the podcast or listening to those episodes, uh, the website is craftsman online.com not craftsman because that's the tool company it's craftsmen <laughs> craftsmen online.com i'll be sure to put that in the uh, episode description as well yeah 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 that's uh yeah don't i don't understand i went to the website and there's just a bunch of tools here <laughs> well that's just it's about every website you go to today honestly <laughs> yeah waka waka <laughs> but Michael, thank you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for chatting. And it's great to catch up. It was really good. Dude, I can't tell you. This has been, uh, as an outsider, just like observing the podcast. I mean, I'm like, yeah, tread on the podcast. If he's tread, what about me? I'm his friend. (laughs) So I'm happy to be here. Um, And and, uh, yeah, no, I, it's funny. Every boring uh, meeting I ever sat in, uh, the notes that I take always <laughs> and forever will be B equals D. And if you want to learn more about that, just drop me a DM or an IM or whatever, and I'll give you the whole story. Oh, yeah. Man. Thank you. And until the next episode, have a good one, everyone. <laughs>